Man, it is good to be in God's house this morning. Man, I, I'm just fired up. I've had such a good morning. Um, just being with you is awesome. Awesome. This is just an awesome place, man. God just shows up, and it's really cool, and I know he's going to this morning during this service as well. Um, if you are new, uh, if you're visiting or, you know, well, heck, if you've been here for a long time, I want to say welcome. Uh, it, it, we do want more for you more than anything else is for you to, to feel welcome. Let me remind you, if you have little kids, uh, if they begin to get loud, if you have them in the service, if they begin to get loud and they begin to become a distraction, we ask that you take them out of the sanctuary um, so that you don't distract people around you uh, from hearing from God. Uh, God has a powerful word and a challenge for us this, us this morning, and we just don't want to miss it. So um, help us out with that, uh, and we'll all get through it together awesomely. <laughs> Oh, man, this is uh, an exciting week. We have Easter services coming up, baptisms coming up, uh, Easter egg hunt is this week. How cool is that? You know that this weekend is the last weekend that we don't have a Saturday service. Next weekend, we're kicking off our Saturday night service. How exciting is that? Um, Yeah, you know... I, the, I really, I truly believe that this is going to be a monumental time for us as a church. I think it's going to mark a point in us where we just really see the hand of God move in a powerful way. Even more than we've already seen, we're going to see life change all over the place. I believe God's going to do a work in and through this church. I believe a lot of people are going to show up to Saturday, and we are going to reach more people with the message of Jesus Christ. And I'm excited about that, and I hope you are too. Now, one thing I do want to announce, um, and this is kind of a big deal, so everybody listen close. Um, the two weeks from today, so the week after Easter Sunday, we are going to have our dessert auction. Now, <laughs> woo! So you guys have been to the dessert auction before. The dessert auction is a really good time. But if you haven't been to the dessert auction, or if you're like, well, what's a dessert auction? Let me explain it to you. The dessert auction is a fundraiser that we do as a church. Every year, uh, we have this this. Uh, fundraiser, all the proceeds go to help our teen ministries. This is to help them go on our discipleship and mission trips. Every year, we, the teens, junior and senior high, we take them uh, on these discipleship trips, and they are changed forever. It's a really awesome thing, but it costs a good bit of money, so we try to raise the funds through this fundraiser, the dessert auction, and it's really simple. What you do is we get people in our congregation, that would be you, to make desserts. Now, I think everybody has, like, a famous recipe dessert, right? The, my grandmother's recipe for apple pie is better than anyone, right? Everybody's got that one, or my cupcake, re- or my cheesecake recipe, whatever the, my pecan pie, whatever it is that's the best recipe that you've got, we get you guys to make those, and then you bring them in that Sunday, so two weeks from today, you'll bring them in, you'll drop them off in the youth room, and then we'll have judges that will judge the desserts that are brought in, and you'll be put into categories, not you, but your Dessert would be like best cupcake, or best cheesecake, or best pie, or best whatever, or best ugly but still tastes good, or right? Uh, We'll just have these categories, um, and then we'll assign some winners, best overall. And then after the third service, we'll bring the desserts, and we'll auction off the best in class. And the auction happens for everybody. So if even if you didn't make anything, and even if you don't, you know, you're not wholly connected to youth ministry or whatever, the whole church will try to squeeze in here and you'll get paddles like a auction, like a for real auction. And we'll get the guy up here like on storage wars and they'll, hey, hey, yeah, that guy. And, you know, we'll, yep, try to outbid one another. Uh, And it really is fun. It's just, it really, it's just silly, but it's fun. And it's a way for us to have some fellowship together, but raise money for our teen ministry. Uh, So I I would invite you to come. There'll be a little lunch that would be free um, that you can eat with us. And we have some fellowship and have some fun doing uh, that fundraiser together. And I just dare one of you to try to outbid me on a strawberry rhubarb pie. Uh, It's not going to happen. I've been saving. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Yep. Huh. So two weeks from today is when that's happening. Today, though, is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is an important Sunday in the annual calendar of the church. Palm Sunday, it represents Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. What happened was is Jesus and his disciples, they had uh, 
traveled to Jerusalem along with thousands of other people because the Passover feast was about to begin. And every year, thousands of Jewish people would kind of pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They would come to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And so Jesus and his disciples, they kind of joined that. They came to Jerusalem. Now Jesus understood, and he knew because he was Jesus, that he was going to end up going to the cross at the end of that week. So there was a kind of an ulterior motive for Jesus there. But uh, the rest of the people didn't know that. And so when Jesus came into Jerusalem that day, what happened was all this giant crowd of people who were there, they kind of had this impromptu parade. And so they would put the, their coats and their outer garments, they would put, that, put those on the ground. They lined the street entry, entering into Jerusalem. And then Jesus came riding in on a donkey, and then people would take palm branches like this, and they would wave them, like, right, kind of like a flag, and they started to kind of shout this praise. They would say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So you probably see, saw these palm branches kind of laying around. Uh, you are welcome if you want to take these home with you. Um, you grab one, we've got lots. Uh, uh, you can, they're yours if you want to have a palm branch. Uh, yeah, so Palm Sunday. This great day of celebration. They're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna uh, means, that word means, God save us. Now that word is kind of borrowed from uh, the Old Testament. When the people of God were in slavery before the Passover, um, they would say, Hosanna. It was a prayer. God save us. God set us free. God save us. And then after the God did set them free, they would still use this term or this phrase, Hosanna, but they would say it kind of in the past tense of God saved us. It became this um, worship, this praise for what God had done. So they would say Hosanna. And it's really an interesting story when Jesus comes riding in because it was this anticipation for something that Jesus kind of fulfills. You ever had to wait for something? You ever had to wait for something and have that kind of nervous anticipation Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. I see this in my kids whenever grandma comes to town. Uh, my kids are, are young, and so when grandma comes, it is a special, special day of candy and no discipline, right? <laughs> so whenever grandma comes, the day of, my kids, the whole morning, they're waiting, grandma's not coming till lunch, and they'll ask, when's grandma going to get here? Lunchtime. And then five minutes later, When's grandma going to get here? At lunch. A little bit later, I wish grandma was here. Right? All day. When's grandma going to get here? When's grandma going to get here? And then grandma comes around and she pulls in the driveway. And my kids, I don't know if you have kids, if your kids are like this. My kids, when they get excited, they, they hop. Just vertically, up and down. And they're like, grandma's here, grandma's here, grandma's here, grandma's here. Right? And they're so excited. The fun can begin. So when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on that donkey, you need to know something. For the people of Israel, for the Jewish people, they had been waiting for a long time for the Messiah. They had been waiting for the King of Kings that God had promised them. All the way back in the Old Testament, they had gone through their in slavery, they had gone through the times of Moses, they had gone through the judges and the kings and the uh, prophets, all the while pointing, God was like, hey, some, there's going to come a king, there's going to come a Messiah that's going to put all the pieces together, It's going to set all things right, that's finally going to really connect, put the whole world together and hold it all together. It's coming, it's coming, just wait. And at the end of the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, it says, keep watch, and he's coming. And then after Malachi, there's actually 400 years. That's a long time, isn't it? 400 years where the people of Israel didn't really hear from God. There's nothing else written that we have. There's just a time of silence where they're just waiting, just waiting for that hope, waiting for that king who's going to put all things together, waiting for the one that would kind of set them free once and for all, waiting for the Messiah. And when Jesus comes in, they start to say, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Like, could it be? He's here? He's here? Right? And there's this impromptu celebration. And there's an awesome picture. Church, you need to know, if you uh, are here this morning, and maybe you've been waiting, maybe you've got some stuff in your life where you need hope, you need some freedom, you need to see God move, and he hasn't moved, you need to know, he's here. He's here. Palm Sunday, we celebrate that he is here. What I want to do is I want to pray, and then we're going to get into our sermon this morning. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, 
And I ask that for each and every one of us that we would know through your spirit and by your power beyond a shadow of a doubt doubt, that you are here. God, I pray that you would get out any distractions that would keep us from hearing from you and being challenged by you this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to give us life. And help us to see that afresh this morning. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So we've been in this World Changer series. Hashtag World Changer. This has been an awesome series, hasn't it? This has been just so good. Week after week, I have been personally challenged. And it has been so exciting to talk about what God's going to do and wants to do in our church. We're called as a church, and we believe that our church, this little church, can change the world. And we believe that God's calling us as individuals to change the world, that God's going to use us to do big things that we can not even imagine. And it has been awesome to talk about it. If you've missed any of these weeks, I encourage you, go back, watch them online, watch them on our church app, or we have a podcast, which is awesome. Um, You can go and listen to the sermons from the past several weeks. I'm, I'm telling you, they will challenge you. It's been really, really cool. But today, we're going to actually wrap up this series, Hashtag World Changer, and we're going to talk about the one thing, the one thing that if we get this right, then all of those other things are going to fall into place. If we get this one idea, then we're going to change the world. And it's this one idea that everything else we do as a church flows through. Every ministry, whether it's children's ministry, our teenage ministry, our food pantry, our mission trips, our discipleship, our small groups, everything that, that we do is, is an attempt to flow back into this one thing. You want to know what it is? It's telling people about Jesus. That's the one thing. Everything else is secondary. You know, we've said for a long time as a church that we show our love by, to God by inviting. And today's uh, challenge is really simple, and I'm going to give it to you right out of the chute. I want to challenge you this morning to this week invite two people to church. That's the challenge. So, I mean, we could all just go home now if we wanted to. Um, not really. Nah. Yeah, on your seat, you should have seen cards. You might be sitting on them. Uh, Those cards, we're going to utilize those, and our challenge is quite simple. Invite two people to church. Give them a card and and, and invite them to church. That's our challenge. All right, let's unpack this a little bit. Matthew chapter 28. This is after Jesus died on the cross and rose again, and he appeared to his disciples several times, and he was getting ready to ascend into heaven. And he gives them their marching orders. He gives them the kind of big command. He gives them the one thing. And starting in verse 18, he says this. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to do everything I have, uh, to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth. So here, here's, the, here's their command. He's like, all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority, all power, all hope, all, all of the power of forgiveness, all the power of healing, beginning, future, past, everything. All power has been given to Jesus. He's like, I'm going to change the world. All power has been given to me. And so the disciples are like, well, how are we going to do it? How are we going to change the world? It's all been given to me, and so I'm going to send you. I don't know about you guys, but if I'm the disciples, I'm like, really? You're going to send me? All, all authority and power has been given to you, but you're going to send me? Yeah, all authority and power. So I'm going to send you. Who, me? Everybody say, who, me? Now say it with a little more, like, a little more incredulously. Who, me? Who, me? Tell your neighbor, yes, you. Yes, you. So the disciples, Jesus, all power and authority has been given to me. I'm going to send you. Who, me? Yes, you. Won't that be hard? Yes. Won't that make me uncomfortable sometimes? Yes. Won't won't that make me have to step out? Yes. But I'm going to send you. And I don't know about you guys, but I've got to think if I'm a disciple, I'm like, why would you use me? Why would you use us? We are just fallen and jacked up people. We have no power and authority. Here's the thing. He says, 
You go and make disciples. You tell people about Jesus, and I'm going to go with you. My power is going to go with you. That, that authority has been given to me, but I'm going to show up in power through you. You know, there's another part where Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. To the full. Yeah. He says, I've come to you that you might have life, but not just life, but you may be fully alive. So why does Jesus say, hey, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do it through you. I'm going to do it by you telling people about Jesus. It's because he wants us to be fully alive. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that you can just live. I mean, he did so that we would have life, but it's not just so that we can live ordinary lives. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to just live ordinary. He didn't die on you, for you on the cross cross so that you could just watch more TV or, or that you could buy a boat or that you could keep up with your neighbor. He didn't die on the cross so that we could just be average. He died on the cross so that we could live fully alive life, to be fully alive. And we are most fully alive, and you need to hear this, church, you are most fully alive when you are pointing people to a life in Jesus. That's when you are most fully alive. That's when God's power shows up. Because this is our call. This is what Jesus commanded us to. So number one on your outline, you can write this in. You are called to invite people to Jesus. You were called to invite people to Jesus. This is our call, each and every one of us. So here's what I want to talk about. I'm really practically, I want to get very real. Uh, and I want to talk about some pitfalls that we might have. How many of you remember the Atari game Pitfall? A lot of you so, uh, yeah, the, if you're under 30, you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, Pitfall. Atari was this, this game system, a precursor to the PlayStation, the Nintendo. And Pitfall was its biggest game. That and Pong. Remember Pong? Yeah. Yeah. So many a wasted hours playing these games. So Pitfall was simple. You had this little kind of Indiana Jones character, and he would kind of, you know, bounce through the screen, and he had to jump over these traps. Sometimes it was water, sometimes it was an alligator, sometimes it was quicksand. And he had to jump over these traps. All he could do was go forward and jump, and occasionally he could swing on a vine. And he had to collect all of these treasures and then get to the end of the game or the end of his life with all these treasures. And he couldn't collect the treasures if he didn't get over the traps. And I, I want to talk about some traps that the devil would like to use to keep us from inviting people. And I believe that all of us are going to have to deal with these to a certain extent. There's just a few traps that want to keep us from inviting people to church and inviting people to Jesus. The first trap is the who me trap. Everybody say, who me? Who me? Yes, you. Who me? There is not going to be a sermon that is preached or a challenge that is preached, probably, I don't think, that's going to be more susceptible to you pushing this off on your neighbor. Uh, you're going to want to sit here and your temptation is going to be to hear this, I need to invite two people to church. Yes, you do need to invite and try to bounce it off to them. Like, not really me. You're going to bring up every excuse to say why you don't need to invite people to church. I'm just not that guy, or I'm just not that girl, or I don't have the skill set, or I don't have this, or it's going to make me uncomfortable. All said and done, every excuse that we come up with, I'll just be honest, revolves around one idea. It's that I'm afraid of my own comfort, is what it is. I'm afraid of being uncomfortable. You're going to want to bounce this off to everyone. There's going to be a temptation for you. You can see those cards on your chair, and you're going to accidentally leave them at church. Oh, I forgot them. Can't invite anybody. Or you're going to put them in your glove box or you can't see them. Or you're going to run into somebody this week, and I know this is going to happen. You're going to run into somebody, and you're going to know you have your cards in your wallet or in your purse, and your heart's going to beat a little stronger. I should invite that person to church. And you're going to stuff that down. It's like, no, not me. Somebody else can do it. You know how I know it's going to happen? Because it happens to me all the time. It happens to me. Not, not long ago, um, a little while back, I had the opportunity to invite somebody to church. Um, I was on my way. I think I was on my way to church to go to a meeting. And I stopped to get gas. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm really like, task-oriented, especially when I'm driving somewhere. 
And so I, you know, I stopped to get gas and I wanted to get a cup of coffee, but I'm like in a hurry. And I'm like, I'm single-minded. I'm like, I got to get to this place. And so I run in and I try not to make eye contact with anybody in the gas station, right? Just get my coffee and get out fast as possible. So I get my coffee and you know, put the lid on, give it to the cash race or, uh, attendant, the, the gas station attendant. And I'm trying not to have a conversation with her because um, uh, whatever, you know, I got to hurry up and get to the next thing. And so I take out my wallet, and I'm going to pay the $2, and I open my wallet. Now, I have a space in my wallet where I usually keep my Medway cards um, so that I can hand them out. And I happen to not have any cards in there, and it, it occurred to me, hey, I don't have any cards in there. But still, I should probably invite this lady to church. And I, I, I had vividly had that thought, and I'm like, oh, I don't have cards, whatever. Pay the thing, get out. And so I didn't invite her to church. So I'm driving down the road, um, you know, on my way to my, to my meeting, and I kind of feel like this little argument kind of in my, in my heart or in my mind. Why didn't you invite her to church? Oh, that would have been weird. I didn't have a card. I, yeah, I didn't. She would have thought I was a weirdo. If I don't have a card, I, it just wouldn't have worked. Because the gas station attendant opinion of me is like holds a hold of my heart, right? I'm never going to see her again. Oh, that would have been weird. I didn't want to make her uncomfortable, a.k.a. I didn't want to be uncomfortable. And so I, I gave this kind of list of excuses, got to my meeting, stuffed it down, uh, whatever. Later on that night, it came up again. I really believe the Holy Spirit was trying to, trying to work on me a little bit. Why didn't you invite that lady to church? Oh, somebody else would have. I, I didn't have a card with me. I, you know, I gave, here's the list of excuses. I didn't want to be un, weird. I, you, know, you know what they look like. And bit by bit, the Holy Spirit started to put on my heart. He's like, you know what? That gas station attendant, that's my child. That's my child who's lost. If your child was lost, you would turn over heaven and earth to find him. That's my child. And you, because you are, might be uncomfortable, you just told them, to, hey, you don't, you don't need a life in Christ. You, you didn't offer them the opportunity. You could have brought a lost child home. So we sang that song, Hosanna, in the bridge there's this prayer. It says, break my heart for what breaks yours. Sometimes we say that, but do you really mean it? Because if our heart was broken for what God's heart is broken for, 100%, first and foremost, God's heart is broken for his children who are lost. All around us, our friends and family, neighbors, gas station attendants, who are children of God. And they're lost. And you run into them every day. He's like, I put you right in that gas station that could have been right the right time to invite them to church. And by the end of this kind of conversation with God, I was like, okay, God, I, I, I really don't want to do this again. Uh, please don't let me miss an opportunity anymore. And so really my prayer has been, and I don't always get this right, is like, God, will you just help me keep my mind focused so that if I ever see someone who I can point to Jesus, I will point them to Jesus. And my prayer for you and for us as a church is that it would be the kind of church that has the heart of God, that no matter who we come in contact with, we won't put our comfort before the possibility of inviting them to a life in Jesus. Who, me? Yes, you. Yes, you. All right, second pitfall, second trap is what I call the shining star trap. Shining star trap. This trap looks like this, and I know a lot of you are going to relate to this, and I, let me apologize in advance because this one's going to sting. A lot of you relate to this. I'm not going to invite somebody to church. You'll even say this. I'm not the kind of guy that does this. I'm just going to live my life in a way that honors Jesus enough that they see Jesus through me, and then when they ask, then I'll bring them to church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be that good of a person that they're going to be drawn by my, you know, godliness and Jesusness that they'll ask, and then I'll be like, yes, absolutely. Now, are we supposed to live a life that honors Jesus and shines him? Yes. Does it happen that people will see Jesus in you and ask? Yes. Are you still supposed to tell people about Jesus? Yes. Jesus says, all authority and power has been given to me. Now you go and make, everybody say make. make. Everybody say make. make. Disciples. Not you go and shine and be good enough that people jump, you know, 
towards you. It's not, you know, go and make. Remember when Jesus called Peter to be a disciple? He says, you're a fisherman, but I'm going to make you a fisher of men. You know, if Peter's a fisherman. If you fish, you know, what, what do you have to do to catch fish? You've got to put the net in the water. You've got to track the fish, and then you've got to grab them. You've got to actually physically pull them out. You don't become like an awesome fisherman to the point where you, all you have to do is stand on the boat, and the fish just start jumping in. <laughs> right? You have to actually go and pull. So this analogy that Jesus uses, it's like, hey, no, no, there's a go and get them. Yes, you're supposed to live a life of Jesus, but you're also called to, and I'll tell you this, you are never more fully alive than when you invite people to church and invite people to a life in Christ. Don't miss it. Third trap is the I'll do it later trap. I'll do it later. So there's two versions of this trap. The first version is good old-fashioned lazy spiritual procrastination. This happens for almost any step in our, in, in our spiritual journey. And I, I think we all have to kind of work through it in every step. There's going to be a temptation to, I'm going to put this off until I insert whatever the thing is. I'm not going to give until I get my money worked out. I'm not going to, uh, you know, get in a small group until my kids graduate. I'm not going to serve until the, I'm not going to tell people about Jesus until, the, right, you just put it off. That's just spiritual procrastination. And I would just say, can I challenge you? Don't put off to tomorrow the power that God wants to unleash in you today. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. You know, James chapter 4, he says, he, he actually challenges the people he's writing to, and he says, hey, all, all of you are talking about all these great things that you're going to do tomorrow, but life is but a mist. Here today and gone tomorrow, you don't know what tomorrow holds. I'll tell you, you don't, you don't know what tomorrow holds. You have an opportunity to share the love of Jesus. And I would just say like this, you can write this, number two on your outline, you're called to invite now. You're called to invite people now. Everybody say now. now. Who, me? Yes, you. Right now. All right, the second version of the I'll do it later pitfall is what I like to call platform Christianity or maybe status Christianity. And there's two kind of versions of this version. The first is, is I can't, Share the Jesus. Or I can't invite people because I'm not spiritual enough yet. I haven't grown enough. You get this idea in your head of like, oh, I just started coming to church. I just started to get to know Jesus. But I can't do that until I've like learned my Bible more or I know how to communicate stuff more. So I can't invite until I get to this certain level or status, right? And it's rooted in fear is what it is. But I can't do it till then. We've all probably thought that before. The other version of that is you get this idea, you come to know Jesus, you start to take steps in faith, and we've been talking about this a lot in this series, where God wants to do big things in your life, and God wants to use you to do big things. And so you get it in your mind of these like platform positions, if you will. You say, I be, I'm going to do big things, and you get, I'm going to be a missionary. I'm gonna, or I'm going to do big things for Jesus. I'm, I'm going to be a worship leader, or a pastor, or uh, this opportunity. And you kind of get like calling envy or gift envy. And you say, no, no, no. When, once God, re like, once they give me the freedom to get out and preach the word of God, then I'll invite people to church. And I would just say this, the faithfulness that it requires to be here starts over here. For me, I, you know, I'm preaching right now, there's 300 plus people in here, and I'm preaching the word of God, but even still, I'm required and called by God to invite the lady at the gas station to Jesus. And the call that happened over here is the same call when I first started. We're called to being faithful, to show the love of Jesus. No matter where you are on your journey, whether it's the beginning or the end or right in the middle, each and every one of us are called. This is the one thing. Mark chapter 5, there's this cool story where Jesus actually heals um, a man who was possessed by a demon. Now this man was, uh, had this evil spirit in him, and it actually caused him to be violent. And so actually his town had shunned him. They tried to tie him up several times, and he was so violent, he would break the chains and break the binds, and he would attack people. And so they ended up driving him out of town, and he was living in these caves alone, just a wild man. And Jesus and his disciples, they walk past, and uh, the guy comes running out and is yelling at him and stuff, and Jesus says, hey, 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 wait, 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 I'm going to set you free. And so Jesus heals him from his possession. Some of you thought you were a little jacked up. 
uh, this guy takes the cake, all right? But Jesus turns his life around drastically. So then he says this, the guy, verse 18, he says, As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell Everyone in the Decapolis, that was where he lived, the ten cities where he lived, how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. All the people were amazed. So this guy, radical life transformation, comes into a relationship with Jesus, life turned around drastically, and he says, let me be one of your disciples, let me go with you. Now that could have been one of two things. One, he could have been like, well, you've set me free, let me do big things like them. And Jesus says, no, no. Go back home. Go back to where you are and start being faithful where you are. Now, he could have walked away being sad. Jesus wouldn't let me be a disciple. Some of us have walked through that, haven't you? They wouldn't let me. I didn't get to. The other thing he could have been thinking, we don't know. We're trying to kind of superimposing into this guy. But he might have been thinking, I got to learn more. So let me come with you. Let me learn more Bible. Let me learn more about uh, what you want me or calling me to. Jesus says, no, you don't need any more. Go back to where you live. Go to your home, the people you know, the people you work with, and you just tell them what I did in your life. You just tell them your story. Church, you need to know something. Your story, each and every one of you, your story is powerful. Number three on your outline, your story is powerful. It's powerful. It's a secret weapon. I don't know if you realize that. Some of you have big, huge stories. Some of you have like, hey, I was wrought with addiction and God set me free. Or my marriage is on the rocks and God put the pieces back together. Or I was, you know, insert whatever, huge thing. And so you have this massive God story. Share it. It's powerful. Now, some of you, though, have not that kind of a story. Maybe you have a story that's a little less scandalous, if you will. You have a story that's a little more like mine. My, you know, my story, I was brought up in church. I, I was born going to church. Went to church every week. I think in my entire life, I've list, I missed less than 10 Sundays. My parents made me go all the time. I didn't have any major life, you know, weirdness happen in my teenage years. I met a girl. She was a Christian. We got married. And we're still in church. Now, I could look at that and say, that's kind of a boring story. I, there's a temptation to do that. Those of you who have my story know what I'm talking about. Or I could look at that story and understand the power that's in that story. Because, yeah, I went to church every week, but there was a point in time when I knelt and I said, God, be my Lord and Savior. And then God, through the course of my teenage years, where all of my friends were making some really drastically bad decisions, God protected me all the way through that. And while I didn't get it right all the time, he pulled me out and almost set me apart and kept me from some of those things. So that by the time I was in college, I'd experienced just a lot of different stuff that was good. And I could point people to things that were good. And he actually began to use me to lead as just a young man, just still in college. I was at the lead in his church. And that was awesome. I got to see life change. And then I met this girl who was beautiful and loved Jesus and wanted to minister as well. And God put us together and through the grace of God, we got married and then we got to serve in church together and we've seen God move again and again and again. And today, guess what? This is our 12th wedding anniversary. Today. And how, yeah, it's awesome. And we've seen God move. And guess what? Sometimes it's hard, but let me just encourage you if you are married, if Jesus is at the center of your marriage, you can take on anything. Yeah, God has done a work in our lives, and we've seen God move. That's a powerful story, isn't it? It's powerful. It doesn't matter who you are or what your story is. We all have a similar theme. It says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but I am found. You invite someone to church, you just say, hey, you know what? God has changed my world. It's made all the difference. I go to this awesome church. Will you going to check it out with me? You can do that. You can do that. Who, me? Yes, you. Everybody say, I can do this. Can do say it like you mean it. I can do this. Can do all right, write it down. Number four on your outline. I can do this. We're going to set it in stone. I can do this. Each and every one of you can do it. Do you know there was a survey conducted of people who don't go to church? 82% of them said 
that they would attend church if someone invited them. Did you hear that? 82% of people who don't go to church this week would probably go if somebody invited them. Man, that is an exciting statistic, but it's also a sad statistic because what in the heck have we been doing, church? If 82% of people don't go to church and all we got to do is invite them, this place should be busting at the seams. You can do this. We're called to do this. There's something to be said about being fully alive if we just take up the call and answer that call. I want to give us just a couple of, before we kind of wrap up together, a couple of how-tos, a couple of things. Because remember, what's the challenge? We're going to invite how many people? At least two people. That's the challenge for each and every one of us. Let me give you a couple how-tos from Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 is perhaps... Um, the best evangelical explanation in Scripture in the New Testament. Chapter 4, starting in verse 2, it says this, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray. Everybody say pray. pray. He's, he's repeated it several times. This is important. Pray that... I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. All right, number five, the first thing that we do is pray. Pray. He says it three times. It's interesting to note, he says, pray that I will pro proclaim the gospel for which I'm in chains. Paul was writing this passage of scripture Paul, who was the like, evangelist to the Gentiles and wrote most of the New Testament, he was in prison when he wrote this. Notice what he doesn't pray for. He doesn't say, pray that I'll get out of prison. He says, while I'm here, pray that God will open a door. He has his, had his heart broken for what God's heart is broken for. And he says, wherever I am, whether it's good or bad, I'm going to do my best to point people to Jesus. That should be our heart. So he says, pray that there will be an opportunity and then pray that I'll be able to proclaim it. We're supposed to pray. So my challenge to you, you've got these cards. Everybody's got these cards. This week, every morning, every morning, every morning, you know, before you go to work or whenever you're going to like, hey, I can set aside 30 seconds, I want you to grab one of these cards or both of these cards, and I want you to pray, God, open up an opportunity for me to invite somebody to church. I promise you, God will open up an opportunity. There will be at some point during that day when you're going to run into somebody and your heart's going to beat a little bit, I should invite that person to church. Should I? Can I? I promise you, he will. Because he wants us to do this. This is our call. He'll do that. Pray. So pray that God will do this. You need to, you need to know. So th these cards, there's nothing special about these cards. There's nothing powerful about these cards. They're just card stock. We didn't dip them in holy water. Um, there's nothing really, it's just picture on a piece of paper until you actually use it to invite someone to church. Remember Jesus said, he said, all authority and power in heaven has been given to me. I'm sending you, go make disciples. And then he says what? I will be with you always. When you give this card and invite someone to church, say, hey, church has changed everything. Jesus has changed everything. You want to check this out? All of a sudden this has power. And the power of God goes before you. So I heard about a lady, I think she was talking to Pastor Mike, and um, she was getting something out of her wallet, and there was a card in there. And so they got to talk about, yeah, that's great that you got a card, that's great, you're inviting people to church. And she says, oh yeah, and, you know, I invite all kinds of people to church, but not with that card. I, I don't use that card to invite people to church, that card's special. And, and Mike's like, what, what's up with that card? And she said, this is the card that someone gave me when I was far from God. And so I keep this in a place. I can always remember how important it is. She came, had her life radically changed. And after a while, her family started to come. And they're still bringing more people. Just from one invitation, these are powerful. So pray for God to open up an opportunity for you. And he will. And then number six, once you've prayed for an opportunity, when you see an opportunity, make the most of the opportunity. Have the courage to invite somebody to church. Have the courage. You can do this. To just say, hey, you know what? I go to an awesome church. You should check it out. Will it be weird? Probably a little. 
okay. You know, I've given out a lot of cards over the years, and there's been times when it was weird, and there's been times when I gave a card to somebody and they never showed up. There's been a lot of times when that's happened. I've never once, though, like given somebody a card to Medway and said, hey, you should check this out, and had them become angry. Like hostile. How dare you invite me to a life in Jesus? No, it's never happened. I'm going to have the band come up. We're going to we're going to kind of take this thing home. You know, even though every time you give out a card, it may not, produce, you know, it may not have the opportunity to like, hey, for that person to come that Sunday, and then you pray the sinner's prayer with them, and then they are, you know, dra- drastically and miraculously saved right then and there. But let me just say this. Don't be discouraged. Your call is not to save people. That's Jesus' job. Your call is simply to point people to Jesus. Your call is just to simply invite your call is to simply be faithful. You're, you're not, you don't have to save people. The other thing is you never know when somebody's heart might be ready to be invited. And you never know how much life change you could have if you just invite. You know, there was a guy that comes to our church now, but for a long time didn't come to our church. His wife came, and she was heavily involved, and she would invite him to church, and he would be, no, I'm not going to that church. I'm not going there. I'm not going Again and again, for years, I'm not going, it would even be hostile. But then somebody outside of his immediate circle gave him a card and invited him to church. And he said, well, I'll check it out. He, it took years it's like to, to kind of set the stage for his heart to be, you never know. You don't know how many people are here this morning and you've been praying for your husband for years or you've been praying for your wife or you've been praying for your kids and you could be sitting here and have the opportunity just by maybe some sheer accident or maybe by God's hand to say, hey, this is your lost child that you could invite and that could move their heart to come to church. You never know. There was another lady that I heard, you know, she came to church and got radically transformed by God. She's kind of a little rough around the edges, and God just did a work in her life. And so she gave a card to a friend of hers, a real close friend of hers. And she said, you know, I, I go to this church. It was our old card. And at the bottom, it says, a church anyone can come to. She says, it's been awesome. It's so cool. God's changed my life. And the friend was like, okay, you know, whatever, um, and didn't do anything about it. But they stayed friends and interacted, didn't really bring it up again. And months passed, and uh, more time passed, and more time passed. And then that lady... Um, had some major life event happen. And then her heart kind of changed and moved and she called up her friend and she asked her, hey, do you, do, you do, do you still go to that church that takes anyone? Yeah, yeah, I do. You wanna come? Yeah, they came to church. See, you give this out, it may not happen right away, but this is gonna plant a seed in somebody. Give this out. This is our challenge just to invite people to a life in Jesus. And all said and done, you just need to understand, church, it's not just about filling seats. It's not just about, hey, we got this new fad or we got this new cool thing. Understand, this is the one thing. We said it earlier, this is Palm Sunday where we celebrate that he is here. Our source of life and hope and freedom and healing and joy and fulfillment is here. Our message is not just come to this thing. It's come to the body of Jesus, the person of Jesus, the source of our life, the source of our forgiveness. So we're inviting people to this place, and then when they, we get, when they get here, what we're going to do is we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. See, the, the, the world doesn't just need a club. What they need is Jesus. Our call is to change the world, and this is how we do it. We invite people into a place where they will see Jesus lifted up. Jesus who has all power and all authority and all, and all ability to forgive and all ability to set free and all ability to give life. He says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. He is Jesus. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Church, we are going to lift up his name. That's what we're going to do. We're inviting people to a relationship. And so let me just ask you, challenge you, will you do it? Will you invite? Will you have the courage to jump over the traps? What I want to do, everybody take your card. We're going to pray over these cards, and then we're going to just sing a chorus together. Everybody, hold, I want you to hold the cards. Get them in your hand, and we're going to pray over these. 
Oh, what would it look like if all of us took the challenge and invited a couple people? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for each and every person here. Where each and every one of us are holding a couple of cards. God, I know that these cards don't mean anything more than paper. But God, I pray right now for your anointing to fall on these. For your spirit and your power to go ahead of us. God, I pray for you to open doors that we thought couldn't ever be opened. That we might be able to invite someone to church. God, I pray for each and every person here that we would have the courage to show them your love and invite them to church. God, would you just go ahead of us? Would you prepare the way? We pray for opportunities. God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning and they don't know your love yet, God, I pray that your spirit would move in a supernatural way and they would feel surrounded by your love, the love that freed us from sin, the love that died on the cross for us and gave us life and hope. And God, I pray you would make us a church that just doesn't live an ordinary life, but that would be fully alive. God, help us to be able to change the world. We want to lift your name high and take it to the ends of the earth. Help us to do that through your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.